we're filming to a couple days before the seventh anniversary of Obamacare and when we expect a House vote. But what has Obamacare done to America in seven years? So over the last seven years, there's been a lot of consolidation. So the hospitals, the little, the, the big hospitals have gobbled up the little hospitals. The big insurers have gobbled up the little insurers. Uh, that has caused prices to go high. There are other reasons under Obamacare where the prices have gone high because of the mandates. And so the premiums are high, the deductibles are high. There are narrow networks, so people find it much more difficult to access care on a timely basis or even to see the specialist they want or even to see the hospital, go to the hospital next door because that one's not in their network. It has really empowered the health plans uh, who I say are now like the tail wagging the dog for everything that's happening at the congressional level and at the state level. And people are very unhappy because their premiums are higher often than their mortgage payments. They are, lots of them who were insured have chosen to be uninsured. Um, people who used to have catastrophic, affordable catastrophic policies lost their policies. They've lost their doctors, they've lost their plans. There's just been a great disruption across the country and a lot of unhappy people for what has happened. You had an op-ed at the Hill recently where you made the case that the Republicans won at the ballot box because they made a powerful case of what's wrong with Obamacare and the promise to replace it and repeal it. Why, do you, why are you asking if Republicans are colorblind? Because this was like the promise of the election and it's been the promise of the election for three election cycles, basically. And Republicans have won over those three election cycles. Uh, they've won more uh, governorships, they've won more state houses, and now it's a complete Republican control of Congress and the presidency, right? And so the whole idea was to repeal Obamacare. But their bill, the American Healthcare, American Healthcare Act, does not repeal Obamacare. It, it doesn't even really replace Obamacare. And so when Congressman Justin Amash says it's Obamacare 2.0, we really agree. It takes one federal program and uh, renames some pieces of it. Uh, it um, gives a new iteration, for instance, of the mandate. It maintains the guaranteed issue for people with pre-existing conditions. That is the centerpiece of Obamacare. That's, as a matter of fact, the centerpiece of any government-run healthcare system. And so it still is, has gotten rid of insurance as we know it, because insurance is for the catastrophe that hasn't yet arrived. And guaranteed issue means everybody gets coverage. So it's really destroyed insurance, and the Republican bill doesn't do anything about that, which means that the prices aren't going to go down. You know, that's the interesting thing about the GOP bill, the GOP leadership bill, is there's absolutely nothing in there to guarantee that prices will go down or access will go up, nothing. And what are the stakes if the Trump base feels opposed to this bill and yet they see President Trump supporting it? What are the stakes? So I think that the Trump base, if they figure out that, re that uh, President Trump and the Republicans have actually not repealed Obamacare, then this will be sort of like, you know, President Bush, read my lips. Uh, no new taxes, right? Read my lips, we're going to repeal Obamacare and then it doesn't happen. Then where do all those people who never voted before in their entire life and they voted for Trump, where did they go then when the, when the candidate that they totally believed was really here to shake up Washington and do the right thing doesn't, right? What happens? I, I do fear that they will all go back to their homes and not vote again when really what we need is we need them voting for candidates that will bring back freedom and will shake up Washington and will not just do what the Republican elites want, the mainstream Republicans, and that's not even the Republican establishment, that's the term that I want, that will not just do what they want and will truly shake things up and bring freedom and affordability back to Americans. So explain to us what you think is happening with President Trump now joining with Speaker Ryan and threatening House members this week that if they don't vote for this leadership replace bill, they're likely to lose their seats in 2018. What's going on? 
Healthcare is so complicated that usually people's eyes glaze over when you even bring up the topic <laughs> because they don't even want to think about it. It's so complicated, right? And so it's possible that President Trump, just like the rest of the American public, when he thinks about health care, his eyes glaze over at the thought and he just wants to get to where he wants to go, which is to tax reform. But he does have to get through Obamacare and he's really got to do this right and got to make sure that the Republicans do this right so that it is not in the Republicans' lap at the end of the day. And I don't think he really understands that the Republican bill is just a different iteration of Obamacare and doesn't really do the repeal that he promised the American people. And I just think he's got to, he's got to hear that more from Americans that this is not really what the promise was. And when he promised to, before he became the candidate, his only promise was to repeal. Once he became the candidate, he added on replace. Really what the American people asked for was repeal. And they would love the federal government to get out of health care so that the only replace should be sending everything back to the states. But that is not what this bill does. And I don't know that President Trump really understands that that is not what this bill does. He should just stick with his original promise, which was to repeal. And, and, you know, and even he kind of understands this a little bit because he said, you know, we should just let it collapse on its own. And then basically the Democrats are going to come crawling to us to ask us to do something because it's still going to be on their shoulders. It's really about keeping it on their shoulders and then making the Democrats bend. They caused the problem. They can help fix the problem. But this Republican bill, I think will take all the pressure off the Democrats, the Republicans will own it, and it will be just another federal program. Well, I think that the swamp is difficult to walk through. And, um, and because healthcare is so complicated, it makes it difficult for President Trump and anybody wanting to change. But there, there just has to be a decision, a decisive decision that we're going to march back to freedom in healthcare and not just keep going towards socialized medicine under corporate cover. Well, you've been active in the outside policy world for these years since Obamacare. There's divisions within the policy world too. Help tease that out. Who's opposed and what are the problems? Why can't we come to a consensus on policy? So I think even in the conservative world, there is who are your donors? And uh, there are possibilities that within the conservative world that donors from, you know, possibly from health plans to big business to, to pharma, you know, interrupt the typical conservative thinking, uh, but not always. And then there are just personal opinions about what true freedom is. And I think these differences, oh, and then there's the things about, well, what is politically expedient or politically possible? And I think that when conservatives on the ground looked at President Trump, even though they didn't like certain things about him, what they saw was someone who had never been in the beltway and was not going to be limited by politically possible or politically expedient, but was actually there for the American people to go a different way, to turn the country 180 degrees back to freedom, back to affordability, back to the uh, recognition of their rights under the US Constitution, and back to a recognition of the excellence and the uh, amazing country that we have that's called America. They didn't want somebody who was going to go, well, that's not politically possible, and so I'm not going to fight for it. They saw somebody who was going to fight for them in a really powerful position. And so I think that that perhaps even in the conservative realm, even in conservative organizations, sometimes we think, well, you know, that'll never happen. Well, you don't know for sure that it'll never happen unless you try. You have to try. But there are some good things about the GOP bill, right? Well, they have, um, they have the uh, double the amount in uh, health savings accounts. So double the amount that goes into health savings accounts. They zero out the mandates, the individual mandate and the employer mandate, but it's still there if somebody else comes in and wants to you know, just add money to it. it Obamacare is a 2,700-page bill. And really what we wanted them to do was take the 2015 repeal bill, reconciliation bill with repeals that they sent to Obama that he promptly vetoed 
and send that to Trump and maybe even beef it up. I thought, you know, we have a list of about 40 things that we thought should be attempted to get onto that bill that would make it much more of a repeal. And then they could say to the American public, we have repealed Obamacare to the maximum extent that we can, and now we will do everything else to get uh, rid of everything else that's in it. But, you know, really, this is not a repeal. So here it is Tuesday. There's likely to be a manager's amendment put into onto the floor on Thursday. We don't exactly know what it is. They say they've been spending a year at this to get it right, Twyla, the Republican leadership. What's the problem with the process that they're going through? So I think the problem is that despite spending a year doing this, did they ever contact the conservatives? And you know, so they, the, the Ryan bill comes out, right? And two days later, Trump calls in six conservative groups to talk with him about it. That meeting should have happened a long time ago, not after the fact. Then, you know, you had Senator Rand Paul hunting, hunting for the Ryan bill, right? And couldn't find it. So obviously they didn't consult the conservatives in the Senate. And then of course there's the Freedom Caucus who was waiting to see what was going to come out. Why wasn't the Freedom Caucus uh, consulted? I did have one person that I met with say that they thought that they wouldn't actually need the conservatives, that they thought there was a possibility that the leadership would just do what they wanted to do and that Trump could perhaps bully his base into agreeing with it. I, that's speculation. I have no idea if that's true, but it is an interesting thought considering the fact that they did not, they did not consult conservatives. Culturally, Twyla, people are in America are getting used to the government, not themselves, taking responsibility of their health care. And culturally in the Congress, they're used to giving out benefits, not taking things away from people. And the fear that the media instills is that maybe um, you'll hurt somebody if you take something away from them. And it, it makes Congress act unprincipled, I'd say. Um, but um, based on these cultural influences, how do you res change the culture in America and the Congress? So I think Obamacare has been instructive, right? So there are all sorts of people who got coverage or still have coverage, but they actually can't get access to care or they can't afford the deductible, or, and so to, getting access to care becomes difficult even though they're covered. So it's really important to understand that coverage does not equal care. And when you give so much money to the health insurance company and then they can say no to you, they can say no to the drug you need, they can say no to the hospital, they can say no to the specialist. This is instructive. You are, when you give them back their freedom and you give them back their affordability and you give them back their choices, you are actually giving them something. Just saying that everybody has to be covered or they have to be covered with something they can't afford is not, it's not good policy. It's not a gift. They really have to bring back um, competition, real competition, competition that includes things that are not the health plans so that we can bring back the affordability that everybody wants. The only reason we have health insurance is in case we have a medical catastrophe and people are afraid they won't be able to pay the bill and they won't get the care that they need. Obamacare has showed us you can price people out of the market and they can't get the care that they need even if they're covered. So I think you know that has to be the resounding principle. Care is not coverage. Give people something where it can be affordable, they can have access to care, get prices down to the pocketbook, leave us to have catastrophic coverage for the truly unaffordable situations, and all of that will bring the prices down for so many more people. We'll be able to get affordable coverage. So tell us about the wedge of health freedom that you like as something that seems non-governmental and respects privacy and doctor-patient relationships. So the wedge of health freedom, which we call the wedge, is really three things. The, uh, and we, we launched it in uh, 2016, in June of 2016, so it's you know almost a year old. 
And uh, really the very first thing was to identify the free trade zone that is taking place in America that a lot of the American people don't know. So we wanted to give it a name, something that they could grab onto. So now it's the wedge, right? The wedge of health freedom. And in the wedge is where doctors and patients are interacting together freely without outside interference. And so it's cash, check, or charge. Those patients may have insurance, they may have Medicaid, they may have Medicare, they may have Obamacare, but they have found a physician who will work only for them because this physician doesn't sign insurance contracts, doesn't sign government contracts, but is welcome to any patient that walks through their door. So this is the free trade zone. We identified it, we named it, and, and now uh, we have a, a website called jointhewedge.com where you can go and find the practices who have signed up. They sign up for free and they are third party free. So no contracts, right? Their only contract or covenant as some doctors have told me is between them and their patients. And so the prices all are down to the level of pocketbook for the most part because they don't have any of the bureaucracy. They have none of the overhead. They don't do any of the reporting to the government. They don't have to follow the government regulations. And so there are clinics, for instance, that might buy a thousand pills of one prescription and then might include that in a monthly fee for the patients. And so they get pills for the penny as opposed to what you might get, you know, pills for the dollar at the pharmacy. So they do those sorts of things for their patients or their fee for service and they have all of their prices um, you can see them either online or up at, in their clinic. And a lot of times they have negotiated reduced MRIs or reduced lab fees or whatever, uh, reduced hospital costs within their own community. So that's our second phase is to get as many doctors as possible onto the page. Right now we have about 200 doctors from all over the country that are on the page. We hear from doctors who are getting wedge patients, so patients learn about them from the wedge. And we also have a lot of uh, people around the country who ask us, is there a doctor in you know, Lubbock, Texas? Or is there a doctor in z this zip code? And, um, or they say, I want a doctor, find me a doctor. You know? And so we are looking for the doctors to join. But once we get all the doctors who today are third party payer free, then our whole idea is to start peeling off the doctors and practices who haven't even imagined the day that they could be free. So if, if I can tell you a little story, so we have, we have this card here, your practice can escape Obamacare. And this is our invitation to doctors. And on the back of it, it has these eight principles of the wedge. So I gave this to a doctor that I happened to see and didn't know before. And, um, she's, uh, and she's reading this and she's reading all these eight principles and she says, this is great. And then she looks up at me and she says, so you mean all I'd have to do is my job? And there was so much hope in her eyes and her face at the idea because they can't imagine being free from the bureaucracy, from the box clicking and the mandated electronic health record, which keeps them from looking at their patient in the eye. It keeps them from actually having time with their patients. They're always checking this and checking that. Um, there was a study that came out that said for every hour that a doctor spends with their patients, they spend two at their desk filling out the boxes for the electronic health record that Obama mandated. One of the things we would love to have is the mandate removed, right? And so the wedge is really meant to bring back privacy, to bring back pocketbook pricing and to reestablish the patient doctor relationship. And at the end of the day, we don't only want to start peeling off the doctors who can't believe it's possible to be free, but we want to start moving to surgery centers and we want to start moving to hospitals. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could establish charity hospitals or religious hospitals that are free of all the 132,000 plus pages of Medicare regulations or all the other regulations that they have to deal with that ca cause the prices to be so high. They need lawyers and coders and billers and um, regulatory staff. They need all of these people just to deal with the government. Imagine what the prices could be. So the prices of today that, that people are seeing do not have to be the prices of tomorrow. We just have to go back to third party free in, uh, payments. So, so the third party can't interfere. And that's one of the things, if people go online at jointhewedge.com and they look at our one pager, 
they will see that we, our intention is to move away from third-party payment and move toward three uh, direct contractual relationships, patient, doctor, patient, hospital, patient, insurer, get back to how insurance used to be when it was an indemnity policy that paid you the patient and you paid the doctor in the hospital. Can Congress do anything to help facilitate the wedge? Yes, so Congress could take away the electronic health record mandate, that would be helpful, and could repeal Obamacare's prohibition on catastrophic coverage. Catastrophic coverage is really where we all have to go back to. That would be really an indemnity policy, but Obamacare says if you are somebody age 30 and older, you cannot have a catastrophic policy. The only thing you can have is managed care, which really isn't insurance. The health plans really are not insurance, right? You pay all this money and they tell you the limited list of doctors and hospitals you can go to, the limited list of medications that you can have. This is not insurance. This is controlled by outsiders who are really doing the practice of medicine through the doctor's hands. You know, this is not true insurance. We need to get back to true insurance. It feels like what Obamacare has done, and even the insurance companies before that, has disrupted the market so badly and the practice of medicine that it's like the toothpaste has come out of the tube. How do you get it back? <laughs> so the wedge is actually, this is why, so the wedge is meant to say that no matter what happens with Medicare, Medicaid, or Obamacare, we can create the system of third-party free payment outside of that. And like, you know, one doctor that was there at our launch, she, she has 400 patients and half of them are Medicare. They're paying cash check or charge to her because she is truly their doctor. She will go to their homes. She will go to the hospital to make sure the hospitalist isn't rationing her care away. The hospital, the hospitalist works for the hospital, right? So the hospital through Medicare and Obamacare have reasons to ration care. And so she is their doctor. So the wedge is meant to build up this system and grow the system. If doctors refuse to sign contracts with insurers and the government, the government can't do anything. There really is a way to put the toothpaste back into the toothpaste holder. There really is, and that's, that's our whole plan. What are the best and worst ideas of what's happening at the state level on health care? Some of the worst ideas are just incorporating um, Obamacare into their state statutes. Um, another really bad idea is something called reinsurance, which the GOP leadership bill actually helps, and that's a really bad idea. Um, the health plans would essentially be a facade for insurance. They might pay, for instance, the first $45,000 of your care, and then the state taxpayers come in and pay for a majority of it, up to maybe $250,000. Then the insurance company takes over again, but they've usually gotten what's called insurance for insurers, which is called reinsurance. And so that they don't even, they don't even have to worry about those costs. And so it all becomes another big government program that you don't know about because you still have your Blue Cross Blue Shield card in your hand and you don't realize the taxpayers are going to pay for the cost of your care. So that's a really bad idea that's happening at the state level. What we would love the states to do and what we would love you know, Congress to think about doing is to encourage ideas that get us away from the pre-existing condition problem. So the reason that people have pre-existing conditions is because they age out of their family policy you know, they got cancer when they were two years old, right? But they survived, and now they have this cancer diagnosis in their past. They age out, and they're no longer in their family policy, and now they have a pre-existing condition. Or, for instance, they're, they have employer-sponsored coverage. They get a condition while they're employed, but then they want to switch jobs, or they lose their job, or even worse, when they get this condition, they can no longer work, and then they lose their job, and they lose their insurance. Right? And so then they have a pre-existing condition. Why on earth are we in this situation? Why don't we own our own health insurance policies? One of our ideas is to encourage uh, insurance companies, and we might need some you know, congressional or state action on this, to get them to offer policies to parents before the child is even born. Actuarially, they can know exactly how many children are, tend to be you know, million dollar babies. This is not impossible. They buy the policy for the child pre-birth. Pre they keep paying on the policy until the child is mature. They hand it over to the child. 
for a lifelong insurance policy, no matter what job they're in. And so, you know, some of the things for that are just encouraging the uh, insurers to do that, giving tax equity, so encouraging people not to even have employer-sponsored coverage, own your own policy so you are never trapped in this situation of a pre-existing condition. And then the last little thing is we wanted to escape hatch for Medicare. There are people who have private insurance policies and they want to keep those private insurance policies, but as soon as they hit 65, they're automatically, Medicare becomes their primary policy, which is worse, right? And there's no escape hatch because if you don't take Medicare Part A, you lose your social security benefits. So we're trying to get the Trump administration to do an executive order to uh, get rid of the rule that says you lose your social security benefits. It's not even a law, right? So we just need to have that X'd off. And so all of these things could lead to lifelong insurance policies and the end of the pre-existing condition problem.